to the NY Patriot Show, and I got uh, I got my boy Colby co-hosting this one with me, so you already know I'm sure there's going to be a few laughs. Colby, just in case people don't know who your show is by now, let everybody know where they can find your stuff and plug it, please. Uh, one podcast is Conspiracy Playtime, and you can go to our website, conspiracyplaytime.com, which will be video format, the ones that have been taken off of YouTube will be uh, directed to our Rumble links. And uh, Everywhere Audio, Disinfobation is a weekly shit-talking current events news show with you Truthcast Dusty on Twitter co-hosting, and that drops once a week everywhere, but Apple and YouTube. Awesome. Thank you. And the links uh, for him are already in the bottom if you happen to be watching the live. Uh, Any of the lives, I think, uh, that have uh, show notes. His link is already in there. And uh, for the special guest tonight, it's always very exciting to have this man on. I always have great chats. Uh, The fans and the listeners always ask him to come back, so they must enjoy him as well. Uh, We got the Headless Giant. What is up, buddy? Uh, How's it going? Thank you. It's going good. Um, I'm having a hell of a 5-5, so I hope everybody's ready. This is is a... Uh, auspicious occasion because we have the the moon in Scorpio and it's the Cinco de Mayo, right? So we've got a full moon in Scorpio on Cinco de Mayo, five five. This is going to be a great show. Uh, go check out my podcast, the Headless Giant Podcast. I just did a recent episode about Prometheus that I think everyone should listen to. Give that a give that a try. So uh, yeah, so tonight I wanted to talk a little bit about the Templars. There was a uh, often overlooked incident having to do with Kamala Harris and this group of uh, people who worked for her and claimed to be integrated into this fraternal order that was trying to take over police departments around California. Right. So I'm going to do this one a little bit differently. I, um, I was thinking about how to spin this yarn and it occurred to me that I should do it like uh, Theseus, right? So Theseus was the first guy to escape the Matrix. He was the one who slew the Minotaur, and then he followed the the Scarlet Thread back out of the labyrinth. It's the only way out of the labyrinth is to follow the thread. So what I'm going to try and do is talk about the incident having to do with Kamala Harris and then start spiraling back outward through the past and through other locations so that we can get a full picture of what this labyrinth actually looks like. So if we're going to start, we've got to we've got to look at the uh, police reports about this incident where these three characters, one guy named um, David Henry another guy named Brandon Keel and a woman named um, uh, Tanata, I think it's Harris. Anyways, she's kind of a background character in this. Little no story. relation. What they did. Right. No relation. No, well, I think the other, the other one, Hayes. the other one, that That's lady right. was actually black though. Wasn't she? <laughs> That's, there's a different, there's a different, yeah, they're obviously black. not related. Cause they I think the other are... chick was actually black. Come on. Harris. <laughs> Yeah, see, no relation because, you know, Kamala Harris is only black when it's convenient, right? So She's got that Obama blackness going on. Yes, absolutely. So it's an interesting scenario. They they show up at this police department, and Brandon Keel starts flashing his identification, showing that he works for the state attorney general. And he's telling these officers that he works for the Masonic Fraternal Order of Police, right? There is a fraternal order of police, but not a Masonic one. So what he's saying to these people is that he works directly for Kamala Harris. They're here to recruit them. They have jurisdiction in 33 states and all of Mexico. Keep that in mind. (laughs) The 33 part might not be as important as the Mexico part, and we'll get into that in a minute. So, if you want to learn more about this, pretty much the only place to find it anymore is if you look up the propaganda report. The guy on the propaganda report did an excellent job 
documenting all of the videos made by uh, Henry, made by uh, posts made by Brandon Keel. They they even posted pictures of their uh, initiation ceremonies on Twitter. Right. Yeah, that's uh, so, Brad Binkley, and he's, Brad Binkley. That's right. He's fucking amazing on this topic. Uh, that's at Freedom Act Radio on Twitter. I don't know where else you can find it, but that that dude, this is like a passion of his. Absolutely. And very few people are, are turned on to this because after the initial reports, it just sort of died by the wayside. Now, that one of the reasons is because uh, Brandon Keel, who worked for Kamala Harris, they immediately distanced themselves from this character. So they said, no, he's not that important. He's just a low-level staffer. But then you go to the Wayback Machine and you find out that he played an integral part in rounding up parents whose kids were truant. And that was one of um, Kamala Harris's big goals while she was in office as the state attorney general is to start rounding up these parents of truant kids. He was the one spearheading. She gave him special thanks. So it wasn't like he was just some side character. This guy was very important to her operation that put her on the map. <laughs> yeah, didn't she like write a letter talking about this and she like pretty much named That's him right. as like And not only did she write the letter but they deleted the letter too. So you got to go to the Wayback Machine to find any evidence of this special thanks that she gave this Brandon character. So Brandon Keel um these, these three people were charged with impersonating police officers because none of them were police officers, but they claimed that they were. So they, they arrested these guys, and then they found uh, a couple of cop cars and lots and lots of weapons, right? So these guys had um, fake cop cars and a ton of weapons, and they were throwing parties at their place with other people who were posing as cops. So it wasn't like these people were isolated. Now, uh, some news agencies have actually gone and visited the, um, the Prince Hall Masons, which is the mostly black Masonic organization, because in America they had this tradition of not allowing black people into the, the Freemasons, something that a lot of Freemasons don't like to talk about today. Yo, the Moose Lodge was like that for a long time. Yes, it was. The segregation never really stopped inside of these organizations, but they're like, well, you can be a Prince Hall Mason, so why don't you go over there and be a Prince Hall Mason? We don't want you over here. So they went to the Prince Hall Mason. They went to the Eastern Stars, and they're asking about Tanata Hayes. They're asking about um, uh, Brandon Keel, and they're asking about David Henry. None of these organizations have any affiliation with him, at least that they'll admit to. Uh Honestly, he could probably be one of the integral members in these organizations, and they would deny it anyway. After you get caught impersonating a police officer, it's pretty much over for you. They want to maintain their um, air of uh, legitimacy, at the very least. Now, this David Henry character, he's an interesting guy because he also had a YouTube channel. And during this whole thing, he was bad-mouthing the... Uh, I think it was the Los Angeles uh, prosecutor for coming after him, and he was begging uh, Kamala Harris, uh, other congresswomen, to come to his defense. And, uh, didn't he also uh, say Obama? Oh, that, Obama too. Yeah. Because this guy had pictures with all of these characters, right? So he had pictures with these characters, and he was— he was either very well connected or very well timed because he had them on his wall and uh, he was not afraid of dropping names. And he kept saying that they're going to try and kill me. You know, if they're going to come kill me, they need to come do it now and all the rest of this crazy shit, right? Well, he also likes to uh, show up at uh, police press conferences wearing his full regalia. So he would have his, his, uh, apron on and a top hat on and he would have the whole thing going yeah, he looked he like a clown press conference he did <laughs> he absolutely did so this david henry guy he calls himself the grand master right grand master of what we're not sure but 
he was the grandmaster. Brandon Keel, whenever they would show up at these police departments, uh, David Henry would claim that Brandon Keel was his son-in-law. But he wasn't married to Tanata Hayes or whoever this person was. It was never really clear what any of these people's relationship was to each other. They could just be police LARPers, right? They could just be LARPers. The problem uh-huh. is they're very well-connected LARPers, right? So Brandon Keel was their entry key into all of it because as soon as he's flashing that DA's badge, that's as good as a police badge, right? So they let him in. He's saying he's going to set up all of the the necessary things if these uh, police organizations complied with the new Masonic fraternal order. They take him to trial, right? We'll talk about Brandon Keel first. Brandon Keel goes to trial. And they say that there's been a problem with the evidence and that they need to let him go. So Brandon Keel, the guy who worked for Kamala Harris, got off scot-free. No problems there. It wasn't the same scenario, even though it's the same evidence, for Tanata Hayes, who ended up spending a year in jail. The woman. Out of all of them, they fucking put the woman in prison. That's right. They put the black woman in prison. Kamala, but really, that's the truancy program did that very thing. The thing that these other two did, but in the past, it was like single mothers whose kids are skipping school and they're mostly black women. Right. There's nothing woke about Kamala Harris during her time there. She loved to throw uh, uh, drug offenders in prison and keep them there so that she could get more slave labor out of them. Marijuana, too, not like hard drugs. Right. She was very much hawkish, right? She is not the person she portrays herself as today. If you remember back in the um, debates, she was very coherent. She was very cogent. She had a lot of thoughts, and she put put them out there rationally. Today, it's like she's reading a children's book. She's like the Joker, too. Like <laughs> every everything she says she thinks she has to laugh afterwards it's like a tick. very much a hillary clinton type between right? both of them they're she just playing the fool laugh. so yeah she she has a real hard time controlling her emotions because nothing about her emotion emotions are relatable to any of the people she's speaking to At all, which should tell you that there's something deeply wrong with this person. Well, she tries to do, like, when she's in front of black crowds, she tries to do the Obama thing that he used to do, but he was better at it. She doesn't sell being black like he could. Right. And if you remember back when um, uh, Obama drank that uh, cup of water. You're not going to go some water? Right. Yeah. That when, was when he horrible. Did that, he just Michigan, touched his lips to it. He didn't fucking right. take even a sip. When he did that up in Michigan, it almost seemed ritualistic. Like, how could anybody buy into this? What is going on here? Like, it was almost like he was making fun of the crowd, you know? And, and you guys a lot like of ways, to talk about water, too, both of you. So there's a, it's like a water yeah. ritual. It could have been, yeah. I think I think the idea behind hmm. that water ritual is like you're our sacrifices and we're just throwing it in your faces. And a lot of psychopaths get off on that. They love being able to just throw it in people's faces, how much power and control they have over their lives, right? And I think Kamala Harris is one of those people, but now I think she has to dumb herself down to kind of fit in and just sort of blend into the background of this dysfunctional administration. If she starts to present herself as being more coherent than uh, Joe Biden, who instantly gets the focus? Yeah, she's like, God damn it, every time dementia gets him, I got to step it down a notch and look fucking dumber. Dumber and, and less coherent and just repeat the same thing over and over again. Now is the time that she it says is a whole lot of nothing that it is the time now. Just crazy yeah. shit, but it's obviously an act. If you go back to her time in the, in the uh, DA's office, if you Pop go cop. back to her, t- yeah, it's all an act. And that's the craziest part is all these conservatives are falling for it. It's like, how is she this stupid? She's not this stupid. Go back. You, they all watch the debates. They know she's not this stupid. But they'll just go along with it because it's like whatever's presented to them, they'll they'll just sort of go along with it because they fit a certain role. And now that the uh, president's a buffoon, well, the vice president's got to be a buffoon too. Well, 
she fits in the role. So it's very interesting that um, these these three individuals are working in the Kamala Harris administration because women in power get there because they're networked with other women in power. Hillary Clinton taps a lot of these female politicians. A lot of the female politicians on top have a mentor-mentee relationship with a lot of the women coming up through the ranks. And you hear uh, stories about these people and how they're connected to the Elysian Grove or the uh, Elysian Fields. They've got... Is that the thing that Terrence McKenna talked about? I'm not sure. This is this is the um, women's version of the Bohemian Grove. Oh, okay. Right. So of one of one well, of they the all run um, around Supreme with their Court justice. <laughs> one of the Supreme Court justices, one of the female Supreme Court justices, the uh, the Hispanic one that was uh, put in Soya, there. Then, Soya Matuar or Sonia something or other. Mayor, like that. Sonia Mayor. I think there you go. Soda Mayor. Sotomayor is a member of the Elysian Grove. So she's tapping a bunch of other female politicians up through the ranks of these secret societies because this is how they get ahead. Now, I believe it's connected to something much darker, and we'll get into that in a minute. So when um, David um, Henry is about to go on trial, he has a pulmonary embolism and dies. After making that fucking video. After making the video about he's going to be killed, he That's dies. like a common uh, cause of death that happens out of nowhere, so it's perfect. Like Right before he's able to testify for himself. Now, this guy wasn't just a, a crank. He got, I think it was a local Emmy for his work uh, documenting the terrorists coming across the border. Where is his jurisdiction what did he tell these cops his jurisdiction was? Mexico in 33 states. Yeah, and it so, was like he was like a local Fox news reporter, too. Local which... Fox news reporter talking about the terrorists coming across the southern border, and he's got jurisdiction in Mexico. Very interesting. So now he's connected to the border, and his reporting on this one story. If you look up the story, it's there's nothing special about it. Like they're handing him this uh, local Emmy for just a run-of-the-mill scare story about how there's terrorists coming across the border and they're going to blow us up. Now, this is back in uh, 2013, I believe. This is kind of the wave of 9-11 trauma is sort of dying down, but they're still handing out awards for this kind of stuff, apparently. He gets up on stage, and he's thanking his mom, and he says, Ice-T, I believe, is I think the it's guy I, who I, it's Ice Cube. Ice Cube yeah. is the guy who introduced him to the industry. He's a name dropper, so I'm not sure if there is a relationship with uh, David Henry and Ice Cube. Possibly. Maybe he just got his photo taken with him again. You know? You never know. Maybe he listened to an NWA record when he was 12, and he's like, I'm going to fuck shit up when I get older. Yeah. That could be why he's thanking him. You never know. Absolutely. So like I didn't have to use my AK. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So these clowns also had a website, right? Again, you got to go back to the Wayback Machine because this thing has been offline for quite a while. I love the Wayback Machine. This all happened in 2015, right? And on this website, they said, we are the oldest police organization in the world. We date back to the time of the Templars, the 1100s. Right, we're over a thousand years old. We're the oldest police organization, and if you look back, the Templars were supposed to be making the roads safe for the pilgrims coming down to the Holy Land. Right, so basically, they were road cops. They were the guys who go out there and give people tickets. They were the first fucking cops. Holy shit! Right. So, <laughs> yeah, when he explained it like that were... to me in chat, I was like, "Fuck!" I was like, "What?" <laughs> And if you see what they were doing back then, like they were road pirates too. So they would they would take your gold, they would hand you a slip of paper, and then wherever your destination was, you could uh, show them that slip of paper, which had all these arcane symbols on them, and then pull out your gold. Well, in the meantime, they're using that gold to make investments and get massive amounts of interest back on it. 
So they're not just taking that gold, they're also reinvesting it and they're making a killing off of it. This is how the first international banks were started through the first, you know, road police, the, the road pirates, right? Kind of interesting. These are the guys starting international banking. So it's not just policing, it's also banking. This is also a commercial transaction. So the Templars are a funny organization. They keep popping up at very important parts of, of history, right? And in the 1300s, they say that uh, King Philip, the guy who finally did away with the Templars, did so because he was broke and he wanted to get his hands on all that Templar gold that he knew they had because he was make, they were making these transactions. Is right? that where uh, Friday the 13th comes from? Because I've heard that. That is where Friday that, the 13th okay. comes from. That's when Jacques de Molay was sentenced to be roasted on a spit. They just threw his ass on a fire and roasted him. So, interesting guy, this Jacques, Jacques de Molay, the head of the Knights Templar, because uh, his look was copied later on by the Master Mason, right? And the Master Mason copied his look so well, he, he basically comes out as the, the, the writer of morals and dogma, and he's like, look, I'm Jacques de Molay reincarnated. I'm here for revenge. And if you look through Morals and Dogma where he's talking about is is Satan the Lord of Light or is Lucifer the Lord of Light, our master, Mason, doubt it not. You know, he puts this in Morals and Dogma and uh, none of the Masons actually read that book. Anybody who's uh, connected might read it. But, you know, it's it's a tool, a sorting tool within the uh, fraternal orders to kind of get the um, ones dedicated and uh, completely Malthusian and completely uh, unethical to be boosted up through the ranks. If you know the secret words, that's when you can boost up through the ranks and get those cheat codes. Now, these guys didn't have many cheat codes, obviously, because uh, Brandon Keel was never heard from again. After his uh, court date, his uh, Twitter account went dormant. Nobody's ever been able to find him again. And Tanata Hayes isn't talking. She saw what happened to the other two. She ain't talking. If somebody could find Tanata Hayes, that would be fantastic. That's the interview I want to get. Now, these, these characters' story basically ends there because we, we have no idea what happened to the rest of them. But there's a different story going on in Mexico, specifically Michoacan, where you've got Los Caballeros uh, de Templarios in Michoacan, <laughs> which is a... Uh, a newly formed um, uh, cartel that has just uh, taken a bunch of other gangs, mushed them together, and created the Knights Templar in Michoacan. No now, shit. That's where it started? This, okay, everybody admits that these guys are using the name so that they could, you know, have something to draw back on. But this is in 2011 when they formed. Mm. Right, so we're right. talking about now. I'm now I'm up to speed. I thought you were talking like fucking way back in the day. Oh okay. no, no, no! This is this is, you know, at the exact same time that Brandon Keel, David Henry, and Tanata Hayes are saying they're from the Knights Templar, and David, uh, it has a connection to the border. He's talking about, you know, these these uh, terrorists coming across the border and how we need to stop them in his videos. He's probably talking about He's himself. He's got a connection to Mexico there. <laughs> how much of a stretch is it to think that maybe he's got connections with the cartel Caballeros de uh, Templarios, right? Now, there's an interesting story going on in Mexico with these Templars. They are vicious. They behead people. They post the videos of them beheading people. Men, women, children, doesn't matter. They are an extremely bloody breed of cartel, right? One thing, though, is when the, when the Pope came to Mexico, they wrote all over the walls down in Michoacan, we will respect you, Pope. We are the Templars. We serve you. Is this the current Pope? Uh, I believe... In 2013, yeah, when did 2011, because there was a switch recently. I don't remember. Yeah, I'm not sure when that happened, but it's it's important to note that these guys are saying, much like the Italian mafia, they respect the Pope. They respect the hell out of the Pope, right? 
also during this time frame, Michoacan's government is is completely inept. They do nothing to stop the formation of these cartels. And there's this guy named Antonio, they call El Americano down there, who is a Mormon who spent most of his life growing up in the United States. They call him El Americano because that's where he comes from. He forms the Auto Defense League in Michoacan. After these beheadings take place, he decides he's going to take it upon himself to do some vigilante action with his his group of people and go out there and slaughter those goddamn Templars. This was in 2013-2015 time period. He goes out there and kills them. He makes a very big display of it. And guess who comes after his ass? It's the police. The police are more interested in coming after this guy, El Americano, than they are with rounding up the rest of the Templars because he didn't kill all of them. He killed some of the big ones, but he didn't go after all of them. So El Americano is out there doing their job, and who are the police more interested in apprehending? He's the guy killing the Templars. Why? It could be David Henry was telling the truth. Maybe these are Masonic uh, members. Maybe that's why they have a connection to the cartel. And maybe him going after these uh, bloody cartel members is screwing up their operations above the border. Because what happens once you get these people who are terrorists coming across the border, these cartel narco-terrorists? What happens? Well, you increase the size of the federal government. Things work out a lot better for uh, Trump's wall later on because, you know, that's what he was looking into. And then you set up the scenario for Rex 84. So we got to go back in time a little bit. Uh, hey, before you do that, I did want to interject about this pope because it was uh, Benedict the Sixteenth. He was pope from t- 2005 to 2013, and he was like the last Vatican pope. Like the current guy, he's a Jesuit, right? Jesuit. Yep. Yeah, so this last pope, I think it's interesting that they were all about him being Templars and him being Vatican. Well, there's a lot of evidence that shows that the Jesuits were highly influenced by the the Knights Templar as well. Right. Right. So I think what this could be is just is just the the patronage to Rome, right? All these organizations like why do we have uh czars because that's the caesar they all have their hearts in rome you know they all want that empire and it's a slightly different empire now it's a city-state empire three city-states to rule the world but what they're what the cartels are saying is we want in we want you guys to recognize us the same way we're recognizing you right so it's interesting there's uh there's a connection with Mexico and the rest of this New World Order phenomenon, right? But more specifically, in, in the area of Michoacan and the auto defense leagues that are starting to form down there, it shows that the government has completely sold out. If you remember El Chapo, right? El Chapo got out of his, his prison cell in Mexico because the cops were in on it. All these cops are very closely related to these cartels, and I think they wanted to consolidate power. Yo, well, real people... quick, I do want to add something to uh, this stuff. Now, now this is just experience. You know, my experience going through the federal prison system. Um, there was tons of people in there, believe it or not, for being here illegally. <laughs> and the crazy thing is, is that they'll sit in jail. For like, you know, anywhere from like three to like seven years and we'll still pay for them to be in jail and then we fly them home. I, I don't understand that either. But I came across a lot of them that I spoke to in transit um, that had told me that like if you were rich or somewhat well off, you're better off in Mexican prison because it will almost just be like house arrest and everything will come to you. They said if you Absolutely. have money, you will get away with fucking tons of shit in Mexico when it comes to the law. And even if you have to go to jail, you, you can make it as sweet as you want. They were telling me that you, you want a fucking girl, you pay, pay enough, they'll come bring you, they'll bring you a girl. They were telling me if you had enough money, uh, one of the places they knocked down the wall and some guy took up two cells because he paid extra for the other cell. <laughs> like, they'll bring you a TV. 
they'll get you food from the outside. He's like, as long as you got money, you'll live great. So their fucking system over there is corrupt as fuck. If the, and I was told shit like this from multiple people. You know, so I don't think they Absolutely. were just like talking trash just to waste time in jail. Like it was probably true stories. It's it's well known that these cops all have allegiances with cartel members. This is their retirement plan, right? So uh, let's go to Rex eighty four, and then we'll talk about the P two Lodge. If you know about the P two Lodge and how intimately connected that was with the Vatican, so uh, Rex eighty four is a it stands for Readiness Exercise eighty four, and this uh, readiness ac- exercise simulated the um, civil strife taking place down across the border in central uh, central Mexico, Central America, on down into South America, right? Civil strife causing an influx of immigrants into the United States across the southern border, leading to martial law in the United States. And I'm sure if you've listened to any of the old-timers who talked about conspiracies in the 90s, Rex 84 was a big part of it because this martial law wasn't for the immigrants. The martial law was to round up the patriots in the United States using this as the emergency plan to do so. Now, again, we got to go back to that uh, uh, David Henry uh, clip that he won the Emmy for. He was talking about terrorists coming across the border, right? You can start to see the plan emerging. You get the cartel making as much drug money as possible. They're sending members across the border to start chaos and havoc up here to increase the budgets of the DHS and um, the... um, emergency management, FEMA, so that you can get that Rex 84 scenario in place, right? So you've got all of the immigrants, and then you've got a massive amount of um, martial law enacted along the border. And if you know about the border restrictions, there's a 100-mile constitution-free zone all the way around the country, anywhere there's a place that borders Places that are not the U.S. If you look at Florida, so like it, several segments that equal a hundred miles, or like a hundred miles together, hundred miles inward from the border, right? So if you look at Florida, the the um, Constitution free zone is the entire state of Florida, right? So DHS what? can go there and completely violate all of your rights without any recourse on your behalf. Because it's within a hundred miles of the U.S. border, so do they ever they have do it? Jurisdiction. I mean, well, they it's already do- in place, so they can do that right now. They can come up to you and, and beat the hell out of you. You have no constitutional rights. They can treat you like a terrorist within that hundred mile zone. You find a bunch of videos online of uh, pastors going through these checkpoints where they're uh, tased and drug out of their vehicle because they will refuse to say whether or not they are a U.S. citizen. This is back in the early 2000s when this was happening, right? You don't have to say anything because you're not under arrest, but it's a constitution-free zone. Now, it's really interesting, people like Alex Jones who live close to the border, they completely flip on it, right? And so Donald Trump was supposed to be sort of the Rex 84 president, and we did get a lockdown under him. It wasn't just one scenario, it was multiple scenarios. The whole idea and there. A lot, a lot of fucking mandates, too. Mm. Absolutely. It was by hook or by crook. They were going to get their mandates. They were going to get their uh, martial law. And they really did get it in a big way with the pandemic. But I think there's multiple plans on the table. So Rex 84 is out there, and that would play very well into what David Henry already has experience with. And once you get the cops in the United States as corrupted as the cops in Mexico, you could start to see this chaos starting to emerge in a big way, right? We have jurisdiction. All these people are members of this fraternal uh, police organization. They can overlook the other members. Everything's hunky-dory on our end. We can make sure that we get some of that drug money. We can make sure that we can benefit from some of that chaos. Chaos. That's a hell of a fucking plan. And I think, you know, these guys are well-connected. Why not? You know, 
I'm sure further up up the chain, you might have other deep state actors involved that want to see this kind of chaos. You've also got in, uh, I, I believe it was 2008, you've got this drug running or the uh, the gun running plan, Operation Fast and Furious with the ATF. Oh, where my they're favorite. giving all these people guns. And then they're like, like, hey, we were doing it to track them. And then we lost them. So, oops. No one fucking bought that. I mean, maybe some like NPR libtard normies did, but no one else. Like that is obviously a fucking just, it's kind of like Iran Contras in a way. It wasn't as big, but it should have been. If they didn't get caught, I guarantee you a lot of these guns that they were letting walk would end up in the hands of the Templars. And if you had in place this fraternal order of Masonic police that lets these guns and drugs and whatever go back and forth across the border at the designated checkpoints, guess the kind of chaos that you get. Now, we've already had like 50,000 people die on the border. More are dying every day. But do they have the proper Masonic organizations to manage that in such a way to where it will only benefit the establishment? I don't know. What it seems to me is this uh, Caballeros de Templarios kind of failed. And it failed because of this guy, El Americano, who was down there doing the doing the Lord's work, right? Killing these fucking Templars. So I think, you know, good on him. He was he was a Mormon, and there's a lot of Mormons in Mexico. Yes, Lots this, of Mormons in Mexico. Yes. And this is why he was able to go back like and touch the across the Like the old school Mormons, too. The ones yeah. that, like, fucking married 10 year and shit. Yeah. 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 Not like LDS, which is, like, they'll bring cookies to your door and shower you with praise. This is, like, the old I, variant. I, I could be wrong, but, like, when they left Missouri and went down to Utah with Brigham Young, didn't some of them were, like, nah, and just kept going to Mexico, too? So like I Some think like did. from like even from back then I think you kind of had them going to Mexico, and in some of their beliefs because they do believe that they came over here from you know over there Israel before. yeah they <laughs> came over from there and some of their some of their like theories and ideas is that uh, some came up through Mexico and then into Florida and some came down through Canada. So like well, they even Romney? believe that they, they Mitt Romney traveled. is one of those Mexican compound babies. He's they got think cousins. The, the Nephites were He's the ones going He's got cousins in Mexico. There. He got furious once the cartels decided they were going to kidnap and get some revenge for what El Americano did. And they, they kidnapped and killed a bunch of Mormons from Mexico. And I think that was in retaliation, right? Why else would they have a problem with the Mormons? They're, it's the Wild West in Michoacan to this day, right? You've got towns that have completely split away from the state of Mexico. You've got... Lots and lots of different uh, organizations that are doing auto defense in the in the state of Michoacan. So it it's presumably, uh, I think it's fair to say that a lot of this stuff is being organized by people who can actually find guns. El Americano was interesting because uh, whenever he did his videos talking about the auto defense league, he made sure to put you know uh, hose and like. Uh, farming equipment in the hands of the Auto Defense League, trying to keep the idea of guns out because guns are 100% banned in Mexico by law, obviously. You know, that's not the case. But El Americano has those connects up in the United States to get those guns down there. Well, El Americano was assassinated, and he was assassinated after leaving prison. It was it was one of those Lee Harvey Oswald uh, moments as they're walking him out, boom, you're dead. Here's the, here's the, the, you know, the cartel getting their revenge. Was it like a fat Mexican way. club owner with intelligence connections? Was it a little fucking Mexican Jack Ruby? <laughs> well, I, I don't think they ever caught the assassin because, oh, you know, damn that it. might. Yeah, I have a question. Jolly, the Jolly West would have had to jump the border and go take care right. of that fucking guy. <laughs> if, you, if you don't mind, I have a question, just like, I guess your opinion on this. Um, you know, these guys, the, the Templars, I mean, it, I don't know if there's, like, a tie to the Masons, but, like, if there's, like, an occult order behind it, and them, like, in my opinion, like, I know not all Mormons, obviously, are Masons, but I do think it's it's a cover for By Masons By proxy, as well. they are, though. Yeah, 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 no, so I'm like, could that, is that, like, a, a conflict of, like, interest, or, like, one order saying, fuck you to another one, maybe, in another way, like... 
You know what I'm saying? Well, like, because like, if I was an occultist and I had an occult order and I went and blew, shot up a few Mormons, I, I probably might like be like, well, I hope none of these are important people. I'm like the Masons, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. I just I found that to be weird. You know, I think it's interesting because I think there's a a process of being made, right? So when you're a made man, you have to follow a new set of rules and you have to um, bow down before a new set of rulers, right? So let's take the P2 Lodge, for instance, right? The P2 Lodge was heavily connected with the Vatican and they were also a Masonic organization and they were working against the interests of the, uh, the well, they basically own the government of Italy for several years, right? So this P2 Lodge was able to infiltrate and, and extract the data they needed. So what they would target is the old establishment so that they could take over in a new way. So what's happening in places like Michoacan is you've got the upstart establishments going, going to war against each other to establish territorial dominance, right? So whether or not they're connected, at this point they're not made. And once they're made, that's when they can get along and actually, you know, because that's when the hierarchy is established. That's the pecking order, right? So the pecking order, I don't think, was fully uh, mapped out in that region. It was the Wild West. And they were trying to establish territorial dominance one way or the other. Well, El Americano was trying to do the same thing on behalf of the Mormons, right? So you've got these sort of off. There's a reason why we've never heard of this story in the United States. Right. It's because you're not allowed to really know about this stuff where things are starting to establish territorial dominance, because later on, once they become a bigger factor in your life, you're not su supposed to know the history, which is why I'm going into it, because of the fact that the only way out of the labyrinth is to follow the crimson thread, go back out the way you came. Right. The only way you can do that is by knowing the history. And I think that's an important factor in in unraveling this whole thing so this was a rise and a fall that was very brief but it could have gone differently what if these other um police departments had said well look i mean do we really have really good representation with our uh you know fraternal order of police maybe not maybe we can get better representation with this guy because he's got connects within the da's office right so Maybe their offer wasn't enough to, to turn the existing law enforcement. But if it was, we could be looking at a completely different scenario right now. If there are connections to Mexico, if there are connections to narco-terrorism, that's going to change the shape of the United States in a big way. You think that's like part off. of what's going on now? That's the rise and fall. It has to be what's going on now. I mean, it makes more sense than anything I've heard before. Like the fentanyl and China connection, like I tried to look into that. Like I think this makes way fucking more sense, and it might have something to do with fentanyl too. But right, well, they'll take any drugs they can get and smuggle them across, and as long as they can make them popular. Look, all those news reports about how bad fentanyl was, it was the same thing as the crack epidemic in the 1980s. They just wanted to get people hooked. They're like, look how bad fentanyl is. Just a little drop of it is going to get you. It makes your it's heroin gonna... go from a one to a ten in four seconds or less. There's like a fucking all infomercial. Those, all those junkies are like, hell yes, we got the fentanyl now. We can do this. This is going to be a high like I've never experienced before. Now they're adding trank to the fentanyl. Get that veterinarian drug that makes you go like zombie. Yeah, this Yo, you is know the a lot of apocalypse. a lot of meth actually comes from Mexico, believe it or not. I think a lot of people actually think a lot of it's like you know a bunch of junkies making it in some like trailer that blows up. Yeah, there is a lot of people that do that, but again, like, that's I'm a going, small percentage. Yeah, yeah, that's I, like again, your local meth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when I again, I hate to refer back to it, but when I was locked up. I had assumed it was a lot of people like going to the store and getting Sudafed and making their own. I was actually well, they, under they that idea. That shit out. And when I got yeah. in there, I had no idea until I ran into people that were popped for like tons of it. Like a lot of it screwed. I mean, you're fucked too if you get caught with that shit in the feds. I mean, you're you're getting hit with such crazy time, but it's so much of it was coming from Mexico. They're like, yeah. Like it's not like <laughs> that's like some homegrown drug for you. A lot of it's coming in through Mexico. They're selling it to you. 
I was like, I had no Absolutely. fucking idea. I'd rather hey, do Mexican meth than tra- trailer park meth. That's just me speaking. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it all depends on the amount of meth that's in the person who's cooking it, right? <laughs> the more meth in the person who's cooking it, you never know what you're going to get. He could be seeing <laughs> shadow people. He could be doing all sorts of shit. Fun. The fumes alone, man. I mean, like, you think the masks were ineffective against COVID. Imagine if you're wearing one of those masks while you're cooking meth. Yeah, the, the, the professionals wear gas masks. Right. right. Was, was the, were these Templars, uh, have they ever been, like, popped for, like, drugs or anything like that? Well, that's the thing. I mean, I think they were heavily connected with the police department because when they formed, it was like they were unstoppable. They could go wherever they wanted to. They could do whatever they wanted to. And they could just, you know, get away with all the uh, executions that they were doing. So maybe some of them, maybe some of the low-level guys get popped. That's what they love to do. They love to set up some of the uh, low-level perps and then, you know, say, well, we got them. Pat themselves on the backs, you know. But I think it goes much, much deeper. Why are they calling themselves Templars? Like, what the hell does a cartel have to do with this ancient order? Yeah, of because knights? most people think this died fucking years ago. Like, we Absolutely. got, we were talking about Friday the 13th earlier. That was like supposedly the kind of the end of it. Right. Well, in my opinion, it goes back to 1916, the 68th Convocation, the, the rules. Have you ever heard of this book? I think I have, yes. I might have heard it's, of it. From no. <laughs> Okay, this was a big Bill Cooper uh, exclusive, right? Bill Ooh, Cooper, this, Cooper he, oh, oh, you got my attention. Right. So his uh, radio program, The Hour of the Time, was focused on a lot of these different uh, threads throughout history that were coming together. He talked about the Templars. He talked about the Hashashins, right? Again, it's this drug cartel, right? The Hashashins. These people were so devoted and so cult-like they were uh, assassins, but they were suicide bombers, right? Well, is this they where they buried. would, like, get them so high on hash and show them paradise? And be like, if show you die paradise. in this service, this is, and it's, like, naked chicks and, like, fucking you're, you're getting fed grapes. And they're like, when you die, you come back to this place. Yep. <laughs> and the place that it was called, it was, um, oh, man, this was big in the, in the 70s. They had songs about it. The Halls of... Uh, I forget the name. But anyway, so he had this castle, right? He was a very small kingdom in the Hashashins, right? And what he would do is he would snatch up these orphans from the streets of all these different cities, right? All these little beggar kids. He would snatch them up off the streets, get them super high, and then show them paradise. And then... Once they would pass out from all of the drugs and all of the alcohol, he would he would take them back out on the streets and be like, if you serve me when you die, you can go back to paradise. Disillusionment strikes in. Absolutely. And there's uh, one famous story where he said he could reanimate the head of one of his uh, famous assassins. And what he did is he faked the death of this guy, right, and then had him in a in a secret container underneath the table and he opened up the lid on this and it looked like a severed head, right? And the severed head came to life and started talking. And once it got done talking, you know what he did? He chopped the fucking head off just to show everybody that this was a severed head. So this servant of his that was inside the table, that was the gig of a lifetime. Exactly. This guy was totally ruthless, totally into magic, like straight up the most brutal stage magic you could possibly imagine. What if you could do magic where it didn't matter if your assistants lived or died? The things you could show people. So this guy was had an empire of terror, right? So he would have these little trained assassins go and start working in the castles of these uh, of these other rulers, and any time they got out of line, he would have a hundred of these suicide assassins ready to kill those people. One of the most famous things he did is he would he would line them up along the the roof of his castle and just point. And when he would point at them, they would throw themselves from the walls and just kill themselves just for the amusement of him and his guests, right? This is the Hashashan order. This guy 
ended up influencing the Knights Templar. They ended up teaming up on several battles against the, the Saracens, right? Another um, uh, rival group of Muslims. And this group of assassins influenced the, the uh, Knights Templar to a great degree. They saw the value in the drugs. They saw the value in, in running these suicide cults. Suicide. What do we see today with all the suicide cults, right? So there's a heavy influence in the in the intelligence network that can lead to suicide cults. Because once you've got a suicide cult, man, there's anything you can do, and it's all their fault, right? And the the MK Ultra drug experiments. You're starting to see the picture come together, folks. I mean, come on. So Bill Cooper wrote about this book called The 68th Convocation. You can look it up. They used to have it on Goodreads until people started sharing passages from it. On Goodreads, you could just search. Is it in print? Terms. It's in print. You can find it on um, eBay. Even talking about it now is going to make the price go up because this is not a very common book. God damn it. I was going to buy it. It's live. Though. Buy it quick, man. <laughs> buy it quick. You need a bit on this thing because <laughs> this is... This is the meeting of the Knights Templar, the surviving members, the uh, Freemasons, the Illuminati, and all the other Elysian uh, mystery schools all meeting up with the Rosicrucians in Pennsylvania. If you know about Beverly Hall, you know this is the oldest Rosicrucian organization in America. And they have a place called Beverly Hall in Pennsylvania where they held these convocations. And this was in uh, uh, 1916 that the 68th convocation was written. And in the 68th convocation, they talk about the Seal of America before the Seal of America is unveiled in the 1930s. Was it, they, was it 1933? Please tell me it wasn't. I just... It was 1934, but it was, oh. uh, it was in 1933. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. God damn it. Right? So when it's <laughs> finalized in 1933, they have the Seal of America. And what they say is that the capstone to the American Empire— now, granted, this is shortly after the Spanish-American War, right, where we gave the government back after completely conquering the country. We just gave the government back. We're like, here you go. We don't want to occupy you. We were just you fucking know? with you. We were just fucking with you. You know, whatever. We gave the government back, and in the 68th Convocation, it says the capstone to the American pyramid is Mexico. When we finally occupy and control Mexico, that's when the capstone is complete. And if you look on the dollar bill, you see the capstone there is incomplete. <laughs> Interesting shit, right? So is the so Davy six- Crockett story bullshit? Davy Crockett's story. It might be. Yeah, I mean, like, every story is. I mean, this is like the, the, you know, like we did the thing and now yay. But it sounds like it's more likely what you're talking about. <laughs> that did the divide. All the, this goes back to the cheat codes of, of uh, the mystery schools, right? They've got cheat codes because they're the first movers. Let me ask you a question. In all the small towns in America, you always find a Masonic Lodge. Which came, yeah. which came first? The Masonic Lodge or the town? The Lodge, for sure. The Lodge. Obviously, yeah. they're the first yeah. movers. They're the ones who get to put the people in position. They build power. fucking airports now. <laughs> like, if you like, I, the uh, theories that surround the Denver International Dang. Airport, I'm always like, dude, the main thing is the fucking Freemasons can build airports. And that shows you what kind of fucking sway they have. Because that was like a big international airport. There's like all around the country who's going to do this, and they're the ones who paid for it. I think what's even more interesting is the Feast of Fire. And this goes into what you're talking about. The Feast of Fire, the Order of Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl is a very important character in, in Mexican mythology. This is the white man who came over and taught them civilization. Does that sound a little Masonic to you? Come on now. So this guy is the one who set up all of this empire in Mexico, the Aztec Empire, the Mayan Empire. They all recognized Quetzalcoatl as this white character who brought them all of the knowledge that they had in their societies, all of the ways to build and and the ways of the ancients, right? And he... 
uh, got on his boat and went out to the west, only to return when the Spanish did. I was going to say, Spanish... is it true that Cortez is supposed to be him to the people? Like Look, they welcomed him? Cortez had 400 people with him. 400 right. people. How do you conquer an empire the size of the Aztecs? You just walk in. He just walked in and took over the place. That's not true at all. Because what happened is when he landed on that place, all the other tribes that hated the Aztecs joined up with him. And we're talking about 50,000 fighters. Wow, okay. That makes sense. All the other tribes are who ousted the Aztecs. The cannons and the guns and all the rest of that shit did very little to conquer uh, Mexico City. Right, did very little to conquer that city. Now, it's also interesting to note that in the 68th convocation, they're very interested in the pyramids in Mexico. Very interested. They have this one section where they talk about the pyramid of fire, the feast of fire, the, the pyramid of fire. of fire, and it's it's also interesting during the same time period, the 2015, they found a pyramid under the uh, ocean next to Cuba, really close to the edge of Cuba, under 2,000 feet of water. And they say once the uh, pyramid is finally discovered, that's when, you know, the fire can return, like a Promethean fire. 68th Convocation lays it all out in very much more direct terms than you'll ever get from any of their other esoteric books, right? You have to know the code and all these other esoteric books. But this one was like, this is what's going to happen. This is what we're going to do. And they were very anti-vaccination uh, in that book. Huh. Very <laughs> anti-vax, very pro-natural uh, health. And to this day, up at Beverly Hall, they've got a natural health clinic right there on the grounds. And I, I, I have a feeling if you were to if you were to put a camera out there, you'll find some very auspicious people going in and out of Beverly Hall getting that natural health that they can't get from all these other doctors that are basically trying to kill them. The 68th Convocation should be a staple. Just read it. It's a lot of fucking bureau bureaucratic terms in the first part. But once you get through all that, it's like these people are laying it out. And this is the, the meeting of the Illuminati, the Rosicrucians, the Knights Templar, the Freemasons. And they're all joining together up in uh, Beverly Hall to plan out the future in very clear terms. So if you want the codex to what's going on with the Olicinian Mystery Schools, it's right there. You can get it. Now, how much of a role they play in the technocracy, I don't know. Maybe they're behind it. Maybe they're in front of it. That's unclear to me. But the technocracy is what we're under now. Elon Musk. Back, Sorry. Elon Musk, exactly. His, his mother came from the family of Technocracy Incorporated up in Canada. Yep. Errol Musk, that motherfucker. You got to love him. And that was 1933 also. Absolutely. Technocracy Incorporated was just like the atheist tip of the spear, right? The, the god of Spinoza, right? When they talk, when Spinoza talks so about like pantheism, pantheism, yeah, yeah. When when he talks about pantheism, all he's doing is is replacing pantheism with religion so that he can get away with being an atheist because he's really an atheist. They called the atheists back then Spinozites, right? But you know they were kind of atheists. All I didn't did know that. Say, well, God's in everything. I could say God's in everything because. I'm trying to take God out of this context and kind of put it into a different context. And so Spinoza became the inspiration for, you know, the, uh, the Royal Society, right? He was a huge influence in the Royal Society, and his influence is definitely one of technocracy today, right? Like, you can definitely draw a straight line between Spinoza and this Yuval Noah Harari character. Right? What? The transhumanist movement. The one yes. that Russell Brand kisses? Ugh. Oh. God, Sorry, don't tell me he did that. He did? Motherfucker, I'm sending that. you a pic. Dude, I just saw we follow each other on Twitter. I'm going to send you a picture of that. It's, when, <laughs> oh, it's after God. he read Sapiens. He had him on his old podcast before he went all fucking woke, alt-right shit. And he's kissing him. 
Right on his bald fucking head. I didn't know that guy was influenced by Spinoza, but goddamn. No, I'm, I'm talking about the philosophy of Spinoza, right? Right, right, yeah. And so um, when asked about if he believed in God or not, um, what's his name? The, the guy with the crazy hair that everybody associates with science. Jeez, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name, but he was just such a nobody character. Einstein, the one that went... Einstein, right? <laughs> when asked about... <laughs> I didn't even... I was... About, whether he believed in God or not, he said, I believe in the God of Spinoza, right? And then you can see that technocracy element creeping its way in. So you've got Spinoza who talks about delegitimizing any any kind of a, a God that is outside of the material world, right? He took the God of all of the um, ancients and said, look, pantheism, God is in everything. So therefore, it's the thing that is God, right? So he's taking the metaphysical and the spiritual out of it and boiling it down. Well, God must be everything because it's the things that we can see, right? Playing a big factor in scientism, right? The scientism agenda really comes out of that Spinoza quality. And then you've also got, a guy by the name of John Calvin and John Calvin creates the elite form of justified sinners, right? He talks about the elect. And if there is an elect, that must mean that these elect can sin with, without consequence. It's like those fuckers that fly private jets to Davos to tell us to not pollute the planet. There That's exactly. you go. Justified sinners or Epstein. Epstein's a justified sinner. Right? I would be if He's, I could be. Where do I sign? Where's the contract? <laughs> well, you can't because you're not an elite. You don't yeah. come from the bloodlines. You don't come from the Thank family, you, bud. So. That's a good compliment. Right. So, and then in 1666, you bring it all together with our favorite, the um, uh, Sabbatean Frankists. Mm. Sabotage Zebi going deep inside of the, the world of the husks to pull out the sparks Right, and the way we do this, we have to sin to be saved, because that's what's going to bring back our Messiah. Right, so you're starting to see all of these different threads tie together, and that's one of the factors in why these people can get away with things like the um, the opium wars. Right, if you know about um, uh, the the lineage of the guy who was the president in the '30s, right? Uh, what was his name? The guy who was uh, the World War II Commander in Chief. God, what's his name? Not yeah. Truman. I, was it? No, no not God. Truman. FDR. FDR. Yeah, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Delano family. Do you know about the Delano family? No. He's one of the Boston Brahmins. He's one of the elites that engaged with the um, opium wars in China. He was a smuggler, right? You're starting to see the drugs element, like. They elected a drug-running president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He, his family came from running drugs. But he survived polio, you insensitive fucker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had somebody saying that uh, Spinoza was a Jesuit. I just had was he? Uh, yeah. Spinoza that was excommunicated. Oh, really? From, a Catholic, from the Catholics? Yeah, he was, he was excommunicated from the Catholics and excommunicated from the Jews. It was double double X communique. Right. So his his rebellious personality, like the um, Catholics and I think the Jews were getting together and they're like, why don't we, look, it's been hundreds and hundreds of years. We like Spinoza now. So why don't we take him back into the fold? But it was ultimately decided on that Spinoza would rather be excommunicated. He would rather be on the outside. He would like rather a be a Luciferian type character. Right. Oh, so after 1666, sells more books, sells more books, right? So after 1666, the introduction of the Sabbateans gives rise to other philosophies like Hegelianism, because the jo Jacob Frank was good friends with the banking families of Europe, right? And he was infiltrating the Catholic Church, and he did so through the you know the Jesuits. Right, and then the Jesuits formed the Illuminati and the Perfectibilis, right? And so all of these things give you the idea of the two pillars, right? We can create a uh, rebellious character. We can raise him up, 
and he can then lead us into the new aeon. We can have our human sacrifices through all of their followers, like Hitler, and then the new aeon we create out of that is what's going to give us the legitimacy. So you look at World War II, the decades and decades and decades of legitimacy they got out of sacrificing their black sheep. But if you know anything about Henry Ford, you know he wasn't exactly a black sheep. Hitler wasn't exactly a black sheep. He was highly connected to these very same families. Henry Ford sued the American government for blowing up his car factories in Germany that was pumping out the Jeeps for the German troops. And he won. He sued the American government for blowing up his factories, and he won. What does that tell you about that war? It was staged. It was all about the rebellious son being brought back into the fold, and they brought them into the fold in the United States with Operation Paperclip, right? All of Well, and ties- fucking eugenics was developed by us. The Tavistock and a Long Island think tank. That shit did not come from do you, the do you think? Do you think that's why you, I mean, my opinion, besides the stuff in Ukraine, I even think you are seeing a lot of Nazi symbolism recently anyway. Do you think, uh, and, I, you know, when I say that, I'm also meaning like occult symbolism as well. Do you think that might have something to do with each other? They're reintegrating the symbolism. They're bringing it back into the fold, and they're doing so in an acceptable manner. I think this new wave of Nazism is going to spread yeah. across the rest John of Europe. John Stewart pinned a Nazi. Fucking John Stewart. John Stewart, supposedly a Jew, pinning a Nazi. Things are getting strange. You're not supposed to be able to make any sense out of it. It's not supposed to make any sense. But when you understand the Hegelian dialectic, then it all. Well, I think that's part of the Nazi magic is that it's not going to make sense, but people will fucking buy it. Right. And if you go back to the swastika, the swastika is a symbol of the North Star, right? You've got the seven uh, stars of the Big Dipper pointing directly at the eighth star, which is. You know, the infinity symbol, which is the North Star. The eighth star right there represents infinity because it never moves. The North Star is never changing positions. That's the all constant. So as the rest of those stars are moving across the sky, it lands in different positions in the different seasons. And that symbol is the swastika. You've got the spring equinox. You've got the summer solstice you've got the fall equinox you've got the winter solstice and in each one of those positions the the big dipper is in a different part of the sky making a swastika yeah when i had towards infinity the north star when i had uh symbolic studies on a long time ago mario from symbolic studies we kind of touched upon stuff like that when he was covering the tarot and uh I guess it's kind of a teaser. I guess it'll be for some people uh, that are listening now. And I, mean, I don't know. Maybe we'll come out before this does. I'm not exactly sure. But on the occult, <laughs> on the occult rejects, though, I you're am, the producer. I have no know. fucking idea. I, I, I'd have to look at the stuff right now. I have no, no idea. I, 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 yeah. I'm kidding. Yeah, I you know, I should. Too. I know how to get. <laughs> but uh, I am doing uh, the major arcana with him, and I was hoping that we'll end up going through the same cards he did last time, and should be able to like you know show. You Again, p- a plainly the, uh, a Nazi symbolism to me, even in occultism, you know, with the, the same OA things we're talking episode, about. You guys talked about this very fucking thing. So I got to go check that one out now, too. No, I think that's a huge, so, it's a huge thing that I think is going to come back and people are not even going to realize that they fell for it. And we've been shown time and time again. Listen, it's it's a nice nationalism. I do agree with some of those the ideas. I, it's a good idea to keep your you shit. You racist fuck. No, it's a good idea to have your shit together before you try helping everybody else. But like every time nationalism gets you know popularity, it never fucking ends well. Just like socialism and communism. I hate to say it. All you do is get mass fucking no, killings I, from psychos. One hundred percent. It all leads to the same result. And Any you, it, you got. It's surprising people out there recently that are just like kind of almost getting open about it. And it's like, wow, okay. Well, I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to subvert it. The subversion of nationalism is well underway. I think Trump represented that subversion of nationalism. They start to see these these groups become popular and they prop up their characters to take it over. Right. And then everybody else who's into the hero worship, they all gravitate towards this main character. And then it's back into the same cycle. 
birth, death, redemption. It's all part of this Hegelian dialectic. And the only way we can get out of this maze is by going back to the sources and figuring out how they're doing it. It's all about methodology. Once you understand the methodology, once you understand the political drama, that's yes. when you can start to see how it works. You know, you know when, I, we, when I just recorded Italy and fascism and war crimes and stuff with, uh, with Teresa, I was even mentioning that. I said, you know, if you were to take... Perfect example, I think you take a, not to sound crazy, but if you take a kid, you know, t- you, again, a child is used as the symbol of Tiferet, I think, for a reason, because they're not so programmed and they can actually look at things as is almost. If a, a, a kid was just to watch a couple of things of going on back then and then looked at right now, I don't think they would actually see a difference. And they'd probably say, like, yeah, this is the same thing going on. And what I was getting at is what I'm showing on the TV is, like, on, on the behind me is, like, you know, Mussolini. Big crowd of people loving him. Loving him. Hitler. Big crowd of people loving him. Trump. Big crowd of people loving him. Hey, you skipped Obama. You know, yeah. But you know what I'm talking about? Like, you have people that are, like, worshiping these fuckers. It doesn't matter what okay, fucking. It, it, that's Elon all that has Musk, to be done is and it's worshiping. It's going to be Robert F. Kennedy Jr. too. You just you know, have like, to worship them. It doesn't matter the label, guy, dude. He's 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 climate agenda, like not to we're so derail screwed. too much. We're so screwed if we can't create our own heroes. We are so screwed if we can't create our own heroes, and none. Like once once a hero steps up from our ranks, we're the first ones to tear them down. Once they start to accomplish something of of note. We're the first ones to say, oh, this guy must be a Fed. But then the big guys come out, the ones who are already part of the very obvious establishment, once they come out, then everybody's bowing down because we don't have any heroes of our own. And then, and that's all comes down to methodology. We've got to come up with our own heroes. We've got to come up with our own methodologies because if we don't have that, we're going to be given the heroes that are going to tear us down. I need a hero. I even think Twitter is is, is part of is part of it, and I think that's just an in, like an internet. How sad is that? I think it is like almost like an internet army of like uh, I hate the sound of like Nazi magic. As crazy as it sounds. <laughs> what? No, but but you're right about that, and it's the one social media I use. I'll admit that right now, but you can't deny all the symbolism and the and the. The eleven, the, the, you know, the, the, the eight, bird? you know, now the, the eleven. It's the like the, the twin pillars or Janus now, which is, you know, four, he, eight, eleven. Every it's time just, Elon says something, you can look at his, you can break it down. It's a, it's a He's white, clearly it's a white and blue speaking app. to us. It's just yep. very fucking weird. You you have a bunch of people on a platform with white and blue fucking badges, rah rah rhyming for somebody they don't even fucking know. This, this guy doesn't even have to go out on a balcony. He just has to make a tweet. That's fucking magic. That's the new balcony right there. This comes this all comes down to identity and archetypes. If your identity is 90% unconscious, it's coming through the unconscious. You're going to be manifesting the archetypes you're given through propaganda. Right, you're yeah. going to be absorbing those archetypes that you're given through the propaganda. It's going to manifest, and you're going to be an NPC, unless you're willing to go to nature and learn from nature and get spiritual with it and understand hey, your own. Spinoza said shit like that, though. He did because he was talking to the elites. He's not talking to us. We got to go okay. back to Spinoza okay. to understand these things. You see what I'm saying? Yes, like I do. they're I creating do. their own archetypes. They know their roles, like. People are talking about how uh, Putin is a is a bot, is a Russian plant, and it's like maybe he just understands the roles. He just understands the archetypes better. Maybe he knows what roles he should be playing based off of how these other people have established their identities. Dude, if you watched the movie of Vladimir Putin's life, it's kind of like Forrest Gump. Like, he just, here he is, and then he's here, and then he's here. He just happens to always, like, be in the right place, <laughs> the right time, and he fucking just, you know, now he's... Are you person. talking about that Russian Russian tourist picture where he's standing three feet away from Reagan? Have you seen no. that one? No, I haven't. Oh, but that, that just fits into it. Yeah. This is a great picture. If you look up Putin and Reagan, you've got this dorky this is, look. This, this is real? Putin. 
Yeah, it's a, it's real. It's a real picture. You've got this dorky looking Putin with this camera around his neck, looking like a total nerd, right? Standing three feet away from nice. Reagan. This is when he's in the KGB. He oh, can reach out and perfect. murder Reagan. He's like, right here there. I was. He knew someday <laughs> I'll be able to point back at this picture. Just Absolutely. Like I was. And these and these you know these archetypes that these people are manifesting. Are, are guided along by other people who understand the theory and practice of archetypes. And the reason we're so screwed is because we're given ideologies. And those ideologies aren't the study of archetypes. Those ideologies manifest the archetypes within us. Mm. Yeah, I mean, look, if you look at Edward Bernays really being the it. nephew of Freud, and Edward Bernays' nephew is one of the founders of Netflix, it's just like... And just keeps every one on of those going. characters, every one of those characters in all those big famous movies are archetypes that we end up manifesting. That's how we think of ourselves, right? And one of the big psyops is it always works out in the end because in all the movies, the good guy always wins. So that manifests within us, and we think we need that hero to bring us across the finish line and make everything work out okay. But that's a movie, even well, though it's manifested so deeply in our, our, our subconsciousness, we're thinking we need that hero to bring us across that finish line. And it Chuck Paul Nook. Chuck Paul Nook famously said, happy endings just depends on where you draw the curtain. Because you can make a happy ending out of anybody's <laughs> story. Where does the movie end? Absolutely. Requiem Absolutely. for a Dream or Wizard of Oz? Like, are you going to... Even a Requiem for a Dream, we could find a happy ending in that movie. It could be in the first There's five so many good... <laughs> dude, three quarters into the movie, there's still good moments. Yeah. No, it has to be the mom getting eaten by the fridge. I always go back to this example. In the Star Wars series, who is the biggest villain? Is it Darth Vader? Is it the Emperor? Or is it George Lucas for writing those characters? I have two answers. <laughs> Palpatine and George Lucas for reasons other than what you just listed. <laughs> it's yeah, always George wild, Lucas. But... It's always the guy who writes the script. I mean, how point, could right? it not be? Right. That's so once we understand funny. those manifestations of the archetypes, you've got to go back to the writers of the script. I mean, I think we're coming close to the end of this scarlet thread, leading us out of the out of this uh, labyrinth. And I think it all goes back to John D. John D. His scrying mirror comes from where? Where does it come from? Sorry, Mexico. Oh. The scrying mirror where he sees all of the angels. You know where where his uh, where his his buddy Edward Kelly sees all of the angels comes from Mexico. These are Mexican manifestations, and if you look at the flag in Washington D.C., it is the um, glyph that they used. They had a base six glyph system back then, one through five, and it's the base six for thirteen, the thirteen apostles and Jesus in the middle. Right? It's it's this idea of the 13 colonies, the 13 arrows that the, the eagle is holding, you know, the 13 original stars. What they're trying to do is establish a new eon. And the people back then were so well-versed in the archetypes and the art of memory that they were able to establish this thing because they knew how to connect it to the ways of old. Well, now we're coming to the end of an eon, right? What's the new... Olympian gods that are going to take the place of the gods of the old timey. Uh, Dylan Mulvaney. <laughs> Dylan Mulvaney, right? <laughs> 365 days of being a god of the archetypes. Right. Okay. So let's look at let's look at how each one of these eons end. Right. <laughs> how did Kronos end the eon of Gaia and Uranus? How did he end it? Castration. Castration. <sighs> how did Zeus end? And again, he's the youngest. Kronos is the youngest of the Titans, right? He's the baby. He's the Tifereth. He's the, he's the child. The child ends the eon. What do they say every year? Baby New Year is, is being brought in and the old man is going out. 
right? So the baby new year represents the manifestation that brings all the seeds from the previous eon forward, right? Because all the other seeds would be the other titans, right? All the other Olympians were born first. Zeus, the youngest titan, slays the old man and cuts off his potency and brings in a new potency of his own. Well, we're coming to the end of an eon, and we're seeing the castration all around us, and it's the castration of mankind. They want to ca castrate and take away our potency in favor of a new being, the transhuman. Yes, wasn't there a chick who wrote a book, and she's a trans chick, so from trans... Uh, gender to transhumanism. That's exactly what it is. And that's where we're seeing the sacrifice. And they're saying, this is the end of mankind, and we're going to promote this transgenderism so that we can have our sacrifice so that the new eon can come about. Oof. Scary shit, but <laughs> it all fits. It, <laughs> it fits the archetypal uh, paradigm very, very closely. Very closely. Oh, man. You know, I did, uh, I mean, this is going I back. I didn't like, know this episode was going to go here. Yeah, right? That's yeah. fucking awesome. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, I did have a, this is like, again, going back probably like 30, 40 minutes ago, but I wasn't looking at the chat, so I did want to check it before we ended it, see if there was any questions. But did, uh, Carl? Someone, no, oh, did he? Oh, maybe I should I check. saw Carl said some good shit earlier. I was going to uh, message just, him later. With you, with Rex84, you were talking about before, is there anything uh, that you heard of, like, uh, with FEMA or the Trans-Texas Corridor Association? Trans-Texas Corridor is interesting. That was the um, proposed highway that they wanted to build from Mexico all the way up to Canada. Right. And they wanted to uh -huh. take existing roads and turn them into this internationalist thing. Now, just a couple of months ago, you had an international agreement side between Mexico, Canada and uh, Joe Biden. And it was just like, de facto, we've got a, uh, a North American union. Just write, write the executive order and we've got it. So n all the plans that were stalled out by the Patriots in the early 2000s, they're just going to, you know, do it by hook or by crook. Doesn't matter. We're just going to do it. And it doesn't matter what you say. And look, DeSantis and uh, uh, all the rest of them, they're being distracted by the, the ritual, right? The ritual castration. Everybody's being distracted by the ritual castration. But really, behind the scenes, all of these guys are in on it. They're all about it. And they've figured out... If we keep them distracted long enough, they won't care about things like the Trans-Texas Corridor. They won't care about the 100-mile Constitution free zone. They won't care about these things that, you know, we couldn't get through the first time because that wasn't the big distraction, right? The big distraction is now causing everybody to look left and right instead of looking straight ahead, you know? We know who our enemy is. And if you look at uh, DeSantis, he just signed the biggest hate speech bill in the history of America. I know. And that motherfucker. In Israel. He, he tortures people too in Guantanamo Bay. Like, dude, uh, the fact that he's the new good guy on the right, I can't get over it. It's it's pathetic. It's pathetic. And, you know, Trump never brings up anything of substance. No, he's he like, I let, credit, I let credit for the vaccine and DeSoctimonious can suck my taint. Like, that's his, what he has to bring to the table. That's our hero, guys. That's our hero. That's Yo, the you know what I, thought was, what I thought was funny, and it's like I, I really, honestly, I, I could actually care less about the situation, but I just <laughs> find it funny. Like he's like in court now with like some chick, supposedly blaming him for rape in some fucking department. Store. Well, the that is coming. Old, <laughs> yeah, they start. They mentioned it 2016 too. It didn't do a goddamn thing back then. No, either. but it's, it's funny how like his his response, which I mean, listen, I mean, I he's mean, like. I, I, if I was gonna rape someone, it wouldn't be her. Yeah, and like uh -huh. and like and like you see all like the, the Trump tards and the Q tards are like, oh boom, look what he just said. It's like honestly He just did a mic drop. I was like a, like a mic drop to me would have been like, you know what, I actually have proof that I was so and so and that couldn't have actually have happened. You know, your opinion of their of how attractive they are and just saying, oh, I didn't do it, to me isn't like a boom. A boom is like actually showing proof that this is silly and the case is over with. It's just funny how like someone's opinion and that's all. No facts, just an opinion. It's like, ooh, and wow it over and like, oh, he got them. It's like he just no said he wouldn't what fuck you her. Do, that's all he you said. Can never get, no matter what you do, you can never get a Q-tard to look up an ARG or Operation Trust. <laughs> They'll never do it. 
they will never do it. ARG is an alternate reality game, right? An alternate reality game is a game that you play on the internet where they give you puzzles and they oh, give you code words. Exactly and they give what you it all is. Cicada 33301. Right. They just merge the idea of an ARG with Operation Trust, and boom, you've got the Q movement. Now all you need to do is drop a few bait phrases, like the storm is coming, it's going to be here next week. And Ten days of darkness. And it completely floods the area where people are getting good information out and talking about the things that need to be stopped. It completely floods the zone. Forget about ever getting out information about the North American Union forming. Forget about having a trucker protest protest against the new uh, uh, corridor, Trans-Texas Corridor. Forget about any of that because somebody said the storm is coming. The bait phrase has completely flooded the zone. And if you notice on, on Elon's Twitter... All of the bots are now retweeting all of the Qtard accounts. It's getting ridiculous. It's so thick with Qtards. It's a full time job to mute these people. Yo, I swear How there's, dare you there's say a... anything bad about Elon. He's my hero. I... God, you know. Yo, doesn't it even look like? I'm sure um, you because I know like I've seen you like shit on him, and then you've seen me shit on him. So I know that Colby that you do you must watch him on Twitter. He's my so... least favorite person on planet Earth. But uh, if he's a person, I, I mean, haven't you noticed? It seems like like there's even the same accounts that are always like it's like the, his like his hype his hype accounts almost well, like I he has a doge account that that's always like fucking sucking I his like, balls and like all these Elon. accounts that are always like tagging him or retweeting his shit and it's like are I you even real both, dude I, I i think he re- no he's not but i think he has some real people following him though like i know people in our fucking circles who like this guy and think that he is our savior it's very weird it is Unreal. fucking yeah, alarming. He doesn't look. Elon does not even think about you like you're a human being. He's a new king of a new castle, and that castle is Twitter. All right, and all of his subjects are subject to him. If he doesn't like you, you're gone. And so, making himself that uh, he's the exception maker, right? So, making himself the exception maker, everybody sees him as sovereign, and the sovereign is the one who makes the exception. Right, that's the definition of a sovereign. So now everybody runs to him as if he's a hero, even if they don't like him, because they're hoping that they he makes an exception for them. And that's the way kingship has always worked throughout history. Unless we have our own heroes, it's never going to make any difference. And we're never going to get our own heroes because the people who are paid and the ones who have the bot accounts following them will always find a flaw in whatever you're doing at any time and tell you that you're the fake one. Now, everybody is flawed. Everybody is fallen. Everybody has these problems. And these problems are going to get so much worse because nobody can take this positive action the best you can hope for is to go out into the wilderness and build something of your own. But what chance do you have if it's all encroaching? It's the Tesseract. All of these ideas of the, the shells, right? The shells of meaning are closing in around us, right? These things have no purpose and no, no meaning whatsoever, but it's always closing in because we, we can't plan. Everything is subject to subversion. And unless we're willing to move beyond that, that petty differences, you know, the thing that we've been controlled with our entire lives, we're never going to get anywhere. And, it, you know, we, we have to make that commitment, you know? I totally agree, sir. Yep, yep. I was just saying to my significant other, if we go into the woods, I'd like to just not have internet. Like, honestly, I could do without the fucking thing. Yo, didn't we I remember point, life as a kid. Did, yeah, don't you remember I that? I didn't have point? it. Yeah, it was better. I think it might the internet might be the black goo. I don't know. <laughs> it really might be. Well, it could be anything we want it to be. We could we could transform it. Like look at uh well, everybody has a Richard magical Grove. weapon in their hand now. That's the problem. Right. Look at Richard Grove, right? This guy is is bringing back the trivium and the quadrivium. He's bringing back all of these skills. He's focused on marketing. He's focused on building, and he's got a whole bunch of people that now have a working sovereign system of their own. They make their own exceptions, right? Richard Grove is doing it. I think we could do it too. I mean, he's not 
uh, into occultism like he's starting to. He's starting to see the connections. His thing was mostly about the intelligence networks, right? And then once he got deep enough into the intelligence network, what did he find? Well, he found the Freemasons. He found all this other stuff. So it started talking about the British Empire and the British handoff to the American Empire, right? But then you get a little bit deeper and you find out what created the British Empire. And it was people like John Dee and this, you know, magic mirror from uh, Central America, from, you know, from Mexico. And these things have significance because anytime you're pulling information out of the ether, it's going to have some value. It's going it, to, you might not understand it at first, <laughs> but it's going to have some value. This is where the symbols come from, right? I mean, we can go back to the Oracle at Delphi. And how they did things. And they connected uh, mankind to the gods of nature and the gods of the celestial and the gods within and without. And those things created, you know, movements of art and beauty and, and understanding that we haven't even seen re-manifest today. Like, they tried to in the early 20th century. You saw all of these things like Art Nouveau and uh, the... Um, these other art movements that was just so beautiful and, and fundamental and, and spoke to our spiritual nature, it's all gone, right? Like, why did we stop doing Art Deco? Why did we stop doing these, you know, fantastic feats of, of modern engineering? And they're not even there anymore. Like, I just saw a video online of the uh, wind turbines that they have, right? And in a hailstorm or in a windstorm, they've got millions of volts of static electricity being discharged straight into the ground, right? Because they don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to turn DC energy into AC energy anymore, apparently. So it's like we're losing the basic fundamental nature of our being, which is like a connection, you know? But, you know, that's where we're at. And unless we get some heroes, unless we get some new art, what are we going to do? It's time to go back to the art, man. There's nothing that connects people of multi-class structure better than art. Yeah. That's why I, I That's think, why yeah. they outlaw it when a tyrannical government takes over. Comedy, Absolutely. art. State art takes over. And we've got the state art of, uh, you know, Clapter taking over the comedy scene, right? I think you can even All tell just stuff. just by looking at art in certain areas of the world at different times. I think you can tell when there was even a spiritual like resurgence and like my opinion, like awakening. And I think people were using art to advertise it and like talk to others, or they're putting out like ideas that other people would understand just from looking at it. They would get that archetype or that idea. They know what you're, you know. I think it was, uh, you know, looking at art at times, you can see what was going on in the world, I think, too. Absolutely. I think that's a good place to wrap it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, actually, for coming on. That was great, man. That was a great talk. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, that was like pretty much like two shows. You covered the one topic, and then we... In you know, an hour and a half. That yeah. Was, that was <laughs> Thank you. That was so great. So I was trying to even change it to, like, and more in the title, but, like, it was giving me, it was giving me problems. <laughs> I was like, whatever. We'll see. Yeah. Well, well I, you know what? I, more. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I guess I'll leave it up. I mean, do you think you think this would have a problem getting us anything that you said? All right. Okay. Uh, On YouTube. Yeah. Look, all of, uh, all of David Henry's videos are gone. They took them down. Oh, okay. Right. 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 You got to go back to other shows to find. Is those it David Brendan Keel pretty much wiped too? Keel's gone. David yeah. Henry's gone. Tanetta. I don't know what happened to Tanetta Hayes. If you can find Tanetta Hayes, she's a gold mine right there. You can ask Kamala her about Harris, Mexico. by fucking yeah. God, is one heartbeat away from the presidency. Yeah. So. Oh, I even had I even had a whole other segment to do on Kamala Harris and the uh, the Mothers of Darkness and the Mothers of Darkness. Oh, Jackal that's right. I think you had told me about that too. Belgium. Yeah. But, you know that's that's even more like the thread is is you know goes in all sorts of directions. This crimson thread. Going back to the beginning, once you understand that all of these people are involved in the drug trade, all of these people are involved in uh, setting up ways of creating new monopolies and new uh, cartels, then you can understand their system. You really can. Yeah. 
I also want to add just real quick uh, before we wrap it up too, is that I, I have posted on Instagram. I know I've posted it on social media a few times. It may have even have been included in something we covered on the occult rejects, <laughs> but I have posted a news, uh, you know, a news thing from the TV that even talked about how these people got popped and they were like Masons posing as police. And they do admit that, you know, one of them worked for Kamala Harris. So, I mean, it, it is out there. You could probably even look for that on YouTube and find it, you know. Brad so. Binkley has it all saved. Yeah, he so. has it all saved. He doesn't have the Mexican connection. I've tried to get that to him. But Los Caballeros de Templarios, I think they're connected. We'll, look, you at look, at we'll look at it. Look at it. The David him. Henry footage, it's it's right there. He's talking about the, the Mexican connection right there. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Uh, do you want to just plug your stuff real quick? Yeah, yeah. check out the Headless Giant podcast. Um, I try to uh, talk about the archetypes, talk about the gods. Gods are a personification of a circle of influence. Magic is an illusion used to create reality. We got to understand these basic things so that we can find our way back to this thread and get out of this matrix, okay. just like Theseus did. Look up Theseus. Thank you. I love it. Colby. Plug your stuff. Oh, and I'll have the links that the links that you've given me before in, in the past, uh, Headless. I put those in there, so if people are watching now, his stuff is already in there. And Colby, go for it. So I Conspiracyplaytime.com for the video would be the place to go. Everywhere else, audio. Disinfobation, not on YouTube, not on Apple. You can find that everywhere else. Is there links on your website for the audio or no? To which show? To, oh... It doesn't. All right. I've only been putting your your website. So if I need other links, don't worry about oh, it. Okay. All right. I'll okay. let. We'll talk about that later. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you both very much. Uh, I had a good night. Thank you everybody who jumped in on the chat. We had a decent amount of people uh, jump in. Thank you. That is what's up. There was a lot of talking. Um, it is a little hard for me to kind of pay attention to what's going on with the show with me, like you know, watching the chat the whole time. So I think going forward, I'll just kind of check it near the end. And if there was any questions, I'll bring it up. But uh, thank you for everybody who was in there and, you know, chatting it up. That's why I go live. And until the next one, everybody be well. Later.